Now this morning, we'll be treated to an encouragement by our pastor, Reverend John Scott, who always gives us something to chew on and provides us with an assignment, which we all have to faithfully do. But we know that his talks inspire, they uplift, and they prosper and bless. And so this morning, to bring the encouragement, which is called Resist Not Evil, mm. let help me welcome to the podium our pastor, our friend, our beloved, Reverend John Scott. Good morning, good morning, good morning, worldwide spiritual family. Morning, a joy Reverend. to add my own words of welcome and uh, it's funny Jen said it's something to chew on because my assignment today actually has to do with food but I'll get to that later but I want you to chew on this as we begin this morning is it possible to be for something and against nothing can you stand for something rather than be against anything and I've been pondering this because uh, a dear friend of mine, uh, just, a, just a beautiful person, um, said to me, Reverend John, I, I, I've been thinking out, I'm so worried about the crime in Jamaica and the, the escalating war and terrorism in the world. And what, what, she's pregnant. And she said, what kind of, of world are we bringing this baby into? Well, that's a big question. What kind of world are we bringing this, this precious bundle into? And so I said, I believe that all of those souls choosing to come to the planet at this time are coming to help us make the world a place that works for all. So she said, oh, so they're coming to take a stand against evil. I said, no, they're coming to take a stand for peace. They're coming to take a stand for the light. They're coming to take a stand for goodness. They're coming to take a stand for racial tolerance, a stand for justice, a stand for beauty, a stand for love. And in my view, it is possible to stand for these things without being against anyone or anything. You know, Ernest Holmes, who gave the world this great teaching known as the science of mind and spirit, writes, and I quote, find me one person who is for something and against nothing who is redeemed enough not to condemn others out of the burden of his soul, and I will find another savior, another Jesus, and another exalted human being. Find me just one, and I will have found an exalted human being. And so my friends, I want to talk to you this morning with a message given to us by Jesus the way Yeshua, Yeshua bar Joseph, called by many names, but the way Yeshua. And Jesus, you know, brought us the new commandment to love one another. So when I was talking with my friend who, who asked the question about what kind of world is this baby coming into? I led uh, her in a visualization, which I adapted from one I, I learned from Mrs. Elizabeth Terry, who is a master coach and uh, teacher of neurolinguistic programming. She's a temple member and she's the chair of our strategic planning implementation program. And in our spiritual prosperity adventure, which we are currently enjoying um, here at the temple, online on, on Wednesday evenings. I think we're at class nine of 12. Um, Liz led us in this visualization where she had us imagine that we were uh, painting 
a canvas with our vision of our dearest dreams. And so with my girlfriend who is expecting and who wanted to know what kind of world this baby was coming into, I had her imagine that she was a master painter, a master artist, and paint her vision of a world that works for all. Paint her vision of the world that her baby is coming in to enjoy and to take a stand for peace, for love, for beauty, for truth, and for goodness. And so, I want to remind you, as I reminded her, of the master teacher's words in Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 to 42. Listen up. Because Jesus seems to be speaking across the centuries to all the disenchanted, worried, frustrated, and frightened people of our time. And in this lesson, he gives us the answer to that question. What kind of world are we bringing our children into? But let me share the words from Matthew with you. The way Shoah said, and I quote, Ye have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, resist not him that is evil. But whosoever smiteth thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man would go to law with thee and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. So resist not evil. Now this is an amazing formula for how to handle the situations that are concerning us as a human race right now in this 21st century. And I would like everyone, the leaders of government ever, all around the world, and those people who are still in the old paradigm of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, to really contemplate this, path, this passage from Matthew because it has the secret to the turnaround for planet Earth and the people of this generation and future generations. You know, I have a friend who lives abroad and he also called with this concern about the state of war, the storm clouds of war gathering over Eastern Europe. And I shared with him the same thing, that we need to take a stand for peace. Now, you can't take a stand for peace, speak words of peace when you come to Sunday morning service, sing hymns of peace, dear Lord and Father of mankind, forgive our foolish ways, and reclothe us in our rightful mind, till in our lives thy peace we find. You can't sing that and say that and pray that from your heart, drive through the gates of the temple, and curse off somebody who, has bad, who bad drive you on the road. <laughs> Wham, you have just wiped out all of that prayer that you have done. Because we have to walk the talk. And if you're taking a stand for peace, then my friends, you have to be peace in action. My friend said, John, you can hide your, your head in the sand if you want, you see, but I'm a realist. People who want to, to focus on what's wrong always say, I'm a realist. I'm a realist too. And he said, I was just listening to the news as I was having dinner, and I can tell you the, the world is in a state. So I said, you were eating your broccoli, and instead of a nice cheese sauce on it, you were imbibing the latest news of war and inhumanity and atrocities across the globe. I prefer the cheese sauce on my broccoli, uh, personally. 
He said, yeah, 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 I know. Science of mind again. I said, science of mind and spirit every day, not just again today. We have to live it if we really want to see a difference. You cannot be ingesting with your meal negative news and expect to have any other kind of experience. And so my assignment has to do with your chewing on this. I want you to have at least one sit-down meal with family or friends this week. Choose your nicest crockery, your nicest cutlery, or set your table as prettily as you can, put fruits and flowers in the middle of it, or do a centerpiece that's attractive, and announce to the family, or friends, or both, that this is a celebratory meal. And of course, they're going to say, celebrating, what we're celebrating is nobody's birthday. And you can then say, we are celebrating the health, happiness, safety, love, and togetherness we share as a family. This meal is a celebration of the health, happiness, safety, love, and togetherness that we share as a family. And if you're seeking the ideal partner, then set a place at the table for him or her, the unseen guest, and say as you sit down, this place is, is a place setting for my ideal partner as I celebrate what? The health, happiness, safety, love, and togetherness that I share with those that I love. And gentlemen, ladies too. If you are not usually the one that does the cooking, cook this meal. And if you can't go up to that, order it in. But you must have something to do with serving it. Because you see, friends, we dish out a lot of stuff to people along life's path. And this meal is going to be symbolic of the fact that you are dishing out what you want people to digest and to grow from, and to learn from, and to celebrate in a world that truly works for all. So, a meal this week. Chewing on the experiences that you want to find, the experiences that you want to have, the experiences that you, you yearn for, for the people of planet Earth. And that has to begin. We sing, yes, there is peace on Earth. And yes, it begins with me. It has to begin with you, my friends. You know, the old Mosaic law of an eye for an eye, which Jesus mentions in that passage in Matthew, that law was designed to try and maintain law and order and discipline among a primitive group of nomadic people who were practically ungovernable. Poor Moses, I'm sorry for him. Unfortunately, this old form of justice still seems to prevail in the race consciousness. And as somebody once said, if we, if we adhere to that rule, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, we would soon all be blind and toothless. <laughs> but it is an understandable human response. Jesus was teaching us then that the only way to get even with someone who has wronged you is to bless and forgive them. Wow. You see, when you hold the hot coals of resentment and anger and hatred, who get in bond? You. You are getting burnt. So for God's sake, let go of the coals. And you know, friends, turning the other cheek does not mean that you have to be a doormat or to allow other people to abuse you and to take advantage of you. It doesn't mean that. I'm going to tell you what turning the other cheek really means. It means to look at the situation from another angle. Look at the situation from the side of your divine nature. So we respond one time 
from the side of us that is human and angry and resentful and unforgiving. Turn the other cheek and look at it from the side that is divine, that is loving, that is light, that is joyous, that is full of the goodness of God. That is what it means to turn the other cheek. It means that you are responding as a radiating center of God's love and light rather than a purveyor of anger and resentment and shame. You know, a caller to a radio talk show recently pointed out that the number of people engaged in criminal activity in Jamaica is small in comparison to the 3.5 million well-thinking, well-meaning, honest, noble, and talented inhabitants of our beautiful island. And add to this the, an equal number of Jamaicans in the diaspora, another 3.5 million, and you will see that the number of people who, are, who have lost their way, who have forgotten the truth of their divinity, is relatively small. So why do we allow the minority to influence our thinking and our way of being? It was broad daylight. I had some people uh, come to visit my home a couple of days ago. And as we were going inside, um, they said, you, you live in the front door open? I thought to myself, it's 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Yes. Yeah, yes, I'm leaving it open. Uh, and all who are in search of the light can find it right there. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've shared with our musical director that I want to have written on a marble slab that wonderful welcome that Ernest Holmes, our founding uh, member, our founding, uh, the founder of Science of Mind, has in the front of the textbook, which says the door is open and there is, there is wine on the table and it's cool inside. Come and sit and refresh yourselves. That is how I want, my, I want my home to be regarded, not as a fortress to keep people out, but a place of welcome to people of kindred spirit, people who are purveyors of love and beauty and kindness. And that's the energy that I attract into where I live. Anybody who enters my home is an angel of peace and beauty. My declaration. So that... You know, Reverend Emma said, if you, if you continue to look, Reverend Emma, our founding minister of, of the Temple of Light, she said, if you, if you look at, keep on seeing crime, then you are being a part of it. Because, who was it? It was the long time um, comedian who said, what you see is what you get. You attract to you what you are focusing on, my friends. Focus on love and you set up a vibration of love that attracts more love to you. Focus on resentment and you will attract more things to make you resentful. That's a law. It's a universal law. And Abigail read beautifully that reading from Emmett Fox about practice making perfect. Actually, it should say perfect practice makes perfect. Because whatever you practice, you perfect. And it is really important that we practice seeing the good that we want to experience in our lives and in our affairs. And so remember that although you may not be able to change or control others, you can decide the level of consciousness from which you will deal with people and react to them. Those of us on the side of good are in the majority. Enough away. Enough of us. Know with me that no matter what the banner headlines are, you do not have to worry or be anxious because you can meet every experience on the level of your divinity. Let me repeat that. You can and must meet every experience on the level of your divinity, on the level of your higher consciousness that knows that God is the only presence and the only power. And there is nothing but God to experience and to express. And when you live in that consciousness, when you spend time visualizing and painting a picture in your mind 
of a world so full of the beauty and the color of your most precious and your most highest dreams and your dearest and deepest values. That is the world that you are creating and that is the world that you are preparing for unborn generations of human beings who are coming to celebrate that with us and to teach us to be in the world but not of it. To live from the level of our divinity so that our every thought or every word or every deed is a hymn of praise and a psalm of thanksgiving that glorifies God. And that's our only reason for being here. It is to glorify the creator of all good. And so my friends, as you do your celebratory meal this week, affirm that this is the celebration of what you want in your life, what you want for your children and your grandchildren and for the world, because that is really what it's all about. You know, that passage by Jesus when he says, um, and for, to, for one who would have you um, carry the load for a mile, you know what that comes from? It comes from the old Roman law. It was a, a despotic arrangement where the Roman soldiers were, were uh, by law, um, allowed to compel Roman citizens to carry their load, their armor, their, their equipment, and all of their the stuff that they carried to and from war, they could ask, they could command any citizen to carry it for a mile. And Jesus, the master psychologist, gave the formula that says, you can lift yourself above the consciousness of being an enslaved person. You see, when you're enslaved, you have to do something and you do it with resentment and anger and, and deep, deep, deep sorrow. And he said, but if you offer to go the extra mile, what you're doing is you are changing the energy that is being expressed from one of being enslaved to one who is doing it of their own free will and having, having fun and pleasure doing it. And it reminded me of a time when I was about 14 at, at high school. And in the old days, in the 50s, Jamaican high schools were modeled after the English public school system. And so at my high school, the young boys in fourth form, um, the 14-year-olds, were conscripted like the Roman soldiers, not to carry a, a load, but to clean the cadet boots of the sixth form boys. And everybody had what was called their grub, you know. So. One Saturday, I was a grub for a sixth form boy, and I went into the prefect's lounge. They had their own lounge, just like the, the masters. And I said, gentlemen, good morning. Please excuse me, but I'm, I'm cleaning cadet boots today. Who would like their boots cleaned? And they said, what did what you say, Scott? I said, I'm going to clean everybody's shoes today. I'm in, I'm in, the, I'm in the shoe cleaning mode. And I cleaned everybody's, burnished them, you know, one hour spit and polish on the toe of the cadet boot with a piece of cotton going round around until you could see your face in them. Of course, you know what happened. I was then exempt for the rest of the year from cleaning you anybody's shoes. <laughs> they would say, I need a grub to clean my shoes, but not Scott, he has done his duty already. So I went from being a grub to being the hero of the prefect's room. And then I would, you know, take the occasional cigarette in there and sell them. <laughs> <laughs> It, it paid all kinds of dividends, but I won't. That's another, another, another encouragement. No, it's not an encouragement, Abigail. It's um, <laughs> <Don't do> it. <laughs> stories of, of how boys survived in boarding schools. So, my friends, Jesus admonishes the people to assume their freedom, the, the energy of being free, by volunteering to do that which was formerly regarded as a disgrace and a burden and something to be resented. You know, I see it sometimes in, in shops when people are, are doing their job because they have to, it's just a paycheck and there's no joy, you know. And so they say, have a nice day and it's, it's half past six in the evening or seven o'clock. Day done, long time. But of course, it's been learned by rote and, and you know, and they just do it because they, they're told they have to. And you can, you can transmute that energy by saying, 
for you had a long day. You soon get to go home. And thank you so much. Stay safe and stay beautiful, or stay, stay safe and stay wonderful. And they look at you as if to say, wow. It then becomes another kind of energy that you're sharing because you have turned the other cheek. You are dealing with the situation from the point of view and the standpoint of your divinity. So when you follow Jesus' Jesus's advice and go that extra mile, you are enjoying life as a free person who can choose how you are going to relate to people and how you are going to share your divinity while honoring theirs. Finally, my friends, when Jesus says, Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away, quote unquote, he is not advocating that you give to everybody who, who asks you for a handout. Um, he is actually give me, giving another lesson in non resistance. Let's be honest. The human side of us very often resents the intrusion of him that asketh. I know for me, I can feel my monkey stand up because I have, my car has just been cleaned, the windshield is spotless, and somebody comes and puts a dirty sponge, making the gesture of beginning to clean it. And it's so easy just to forget everything about the piece that we've been talking about and blast him or her. But no. Turn the other cheek. Look at it from the standpoint of your divinity. And so I would say, you know, this youngster has been in the sun all day. And whatever he gets from a motorist or she gets from a motorist may make the difference between something to eat this evening or going to bed hungry. And it just changes the energy right away. And so I would say, no, thank you. And hand them any change that I have without them having to clean the windshield. So friends, don't allow your anger, outrage, and fear to get the best of you. When you're dealing with the problem at the level of consciousness of the person who is irritating you, you are vibrating at their level. So next time you're listening to the news, both local here in Jamaica and the news of what's happening overseas. Resist not evil. Be as our inspirational reading uh, encouraged us this morning to be a doer of the word and not just a hearer. We have to act the part, walk the talk, and make certain that our actions, our thoughts, in every moment are in congruence with what we say we believe. Holmes said in that, it, it, Emmett Fox said in that reading that Abigail shared, there is simply no achievement without practice, and the more practice, provided it is done intelligently, the greater will the proficiency be, and the sooner will it be attained. It is true in every conceivable branch of human endeavor, practice is the price of proficiency. Let us say together, I practice peace. Together, I, I practice, practice peace. peace. I practice love. I practice love. I stand for peace. I stand for peace. I stand for love. I stand for love. I am a purveyor of the light. I am a purveyor of the light. My friends, resist not evil. Instead, follow the admonition in James 1, verse 22. Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only. Namaste. Thank you, Reverend John. Friends. Did I tell you? Something to chew on. <laughs> he says, if you are taking a stand for peace, then you have to be peace. You must live it if you want to make a difference. He says, celebrate thing, the health, happiness, and safety, and love, and togetherness that we share as a family. Remember, that is what we will do in our assignment this week.
And as we sit to have this meal, let us remember to make that, aff that affirmative statement. And always remember we're turning the other cheek. It says, look at the situation from another angle and look from the side that is divine, filled with goodness, the goodness of God. And finally, he also said, you can and must meet every experience on the level of your divinity. My friends, we have to walk this talk because practice makes perfect. perfect. Thank you, Reverend John. Let's give him another round of applause.